Well, kia ora koutou katoa, uh, nga mihi nui ki tenei uh, wānanga, uh, ko David Downs toko ingoa, ko uh, kai whakahaere o tenei uh, hui. Uh, uh, he karakia o, o te rā, uh, whakatakata hui ki te uru, whakatakata hui ki te tonga, ki a makina kina me tara, uh, ki a tara tara ki tai, e he aki ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, a tihe e mauri ora. Well, good morning everybody. Uh, so good to have you on with us this morning. Uh, my name is David Downs. I'm uh, the CEO for the New Zealand Story Group and also your guide, your, uh, your, your convener for the, this event, this webinar. I wanted to start off by introducing uh, my colleagues, my two colleagues who are going to join us. Uh, you know, you'll see here we're having a bit of an experiment with some new technology. So please welcome uh, Alex. Alex is uh, from our, our partner, One Picture. Morning, uh, Alex. Kia ora. How's it going? Very good. And uh, from across the Tasman, Gabriel Purchase from New Zealand Trade and Enterprise. Uh, kia ora, Gabriel. Kia ora, David. Thank you for having me here today. Um, and, you know, just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm calling from today, which is the Eora people um, of the Gadigal Nation, um, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thanks for having me. And we're going to hear both from, more from both of them uh, shortly. Um, so thank you and welcome to the seminar. Uh, we are trying, first of all, we're being a bit ex experimental and, um, and brave today because we're trying a new piece of technology. Uh, as you can see, it's looking a bit flash. It's more like a TV. Um, but if that means that there's a couple of technical hitches on the way, please forgive us. We thought we would be brave. Um, and hopefully some of you are watching this on our LinkedIn channel. Some of you will be watching it on YouTube, some on our uh, NZ Story website. Um, wherever you are, you are able to, we hope, um, put some comments in. And if you do put comments and questions into the chat window on the platform that you're watching on, we'll be able to see them. And uh, during the session, we're going to ask questions and, and turn it into a bit of a dialogue. I have noticed there's about a five second delay. So if you put your question in and I don't notice it, then uh, please forgive me. But please do use those comments. It would be great actually just to, if you're out there, please plug in now where you're calling in from. Where are you in the world or the country? Um, into the comments window and then we'll know that it's working. So that would be great if you could do that. Um, we have uh, 192 of you at least online and uh, we know that many will watch this uh, later as well. So kia ora to you all. Um, so this web, uh, webinar this morning is brought to you by the, the New Zealand Story Group. And uh, I wanted to you know, just talk about what we're gonna, what we're gonna cover today, uh, what Gabriel and Alex and I will be talking about. Um, so the agenda that this morning, we really have three um, big parts of this research, and we're going to look at each of them, the consumer insights, the business insights, and the sector insights. Let me just show you this. This is clearly working. We've got Catherine calling in from Tokyo, Japan. That's very nice. We've got uh, someone calling in from sunny Auckland. That's obviously a joke. Um, uh, lots and lots of people. Thank you for putting it in. Someone from Otatahi. Uh, so um, yeah, many people from dialing in from around New Zealand and the world to hear about what Australians and Australia thinks of New Zealand. So as I mentioned, three big sections, we have a consumer insight section. That's probably the bulk of this research, what Australian consumers are thinking and feeling about themselves and about New Zealand. And at the end of that segment, Alex will pause, Alex is gonna be presenting, he'll pause. And then we thought we'd do Q and A about that bit because it's quite a substantial piece. And so we'll use this chat window and this function uh, like we're seeing at the bottom of the screen at the moment. We've got someone here for calling in, Alan from uh, Whanganui, uh, welcome, my old hometown. Um, and we'll have those Q&A sessions uh, and a, a, Gabriel and Alex and I will, will convene them. And then we'll head into the second part of the research, which is the business insights and do the same thing again with the Q&A, sort of a different set of insights coming through the um, business uh, area. So we'd like to dwell on that. And then lastly, uh, we'll look at the sector insights. Um, we've got some sector drilling as well. So this will all make sense, I promise, as we go through uh, the webinar. Um, but I guess the key thing is we loved your interaction, like we're seeing, you know, coming up, popping up in the in the chat right now. It's really good. So, um, you know, people from all around the country, all around the world, um, dialing into this, this research, which is great. So that's our plan for this morning. Just in terms of who we are as New Zealand Story, we wanted to take this opportunity to just to introduce ourselves for those of you who might not know um, and give you just a couple of slides of kind of information about the New Zealand Story before we get into um, Alex's material. 
So New Zealand Story is a government organisation. We are co-owned. I like to say we're a kind of a weird joint venture inside government. You can see there, there are six government agencies who, who, um, who kind of own New Zealand Story. And the purpose for that is because we complement and work with each of those agencies um, in different ways. Uh, we, we work with their marketing international teams, we work with them uh, on the kind of their go-to-market strategies, and we, we complement and supplement the research work and the, uh, the marketing work that they do. And our job as New Zealand Story is to inspire, curate, and amplify the storytelling from across New Zealand for the purpose of growing the brand of New Zealand internationally and growing the value of the brand of New Zealand in particular. Uh, each of those agencies we do different things with. Um, today, largely, we, we're going to be talking about trade and exporting, um, particularly from the point of view of that um, the business audience and the sector audience. And so we've asked um, Gabriel from New Zealand Trade and Enterprise in Sydney to join us to give her reflections on uh, on the content as well. But in other days, we'll, we'll be talking more about tourism or, or, or dip, diplomacy, et cetera. So trade and, uh, New Zealand Story is uh, this government entity. Um, our, our role is really to kind of capture the brand of New Zealand and work with sector groups and industries and other government agencies to basically tell that story in a way that builds the value for everybody about um, who is New Zealand, what do we stand for in the world, and how does New Zealand kind of gain that share of mindset and market uh, marketing uh, cut through um, so that we as a country kind of, you know, can really project ourselves on the international stage in a, in a very complete way, not just... Um, reinforcing what people already know about us, but trying to show them different things about New Zealand. Um, we have a particular service offering. Um, so if you go onto our website at some point, you'll be able to see that you can, for example, download images and videos and infographics and other content from our toolkit. That's a really well used part of our offering. Um, we do a lot of social media content and other content internationally, sort of putting these little stories of New Zealand out there. You would have seen at the beginning of this, a little video that, that was on repeat that was just showing some of the information about New Zealand in a way that people might not have seen it before and we try and get that kind of information out there. Um, we do quite a substantial amount of research and today is a great example. Um, we do both quantitative and qualitative research, uh, understanding international perceptions of New Zealand, how that's changing. Uh, in the consultancy area, we work with major events and trade missions and major sector groups and companies to basically help them really weave the New Zealand story into their work. Uh, and last but not least, we have the Fern Mark, which is the trademark uh, for New Zealand. And I'm going to talk more about that at the end of the webinar. But really, that is you know, by far the best way that companies have or organisations have to attach themselves to this very you know, prestigious brand of New Zealand. So we talked about the research. The research is a big part of what we do. We know that in order for New Zealand to project ourselves and create a brand on the world stage, we actually need to understand what those countries, those markets, consumers, business people, buyers, what they think of us. And it's changing very dynamically. And over the last um, uh, couple of years, in particular through the COVID period, we've seen some quite dramatic changes and shifts in the perceptions of New Zealand from the rest of the world. Uh, and that's coming through in lots of different parts of our research through our quantitative work uh, with Kantar and deeply with the work that we do with One Picture, our research partner who does a lot of qualitative work with us. And so I'm going to bring um, Alex Jones into, uh, into frame. Alex is one of the research partners with One Picture and Alex has been uh, diving into the, the quantitative and the qualitative and really pulling out what are the key insights for, for all of us from the research. So. Alex, thanks very much for the work that you're doing. And uh, I'm going to hand it to you to talk through the kind of consumer perspective from the research. And you're on mute. We've got that classic thing going on. <laughs> as always, I thought I shut myself off. Uh, kia ora, David. Thanks for that um, as well. Thanks for that introduction. Tēnā kato kato. Uh, ko Alex Takawinga. I am a consumer strategy director at One Picture, and what I'm going to be taking you through today, like David said, was what are the Australian perceptions of New Zealand? So that encompassed both a business perspective and a consumer perspective, like David said. So we'll make sure that we're unpicking both as we go through. But the real objective of today is thinking about how we can turn up fit for turning up fit for business in this Australian market, and what does that start to look like? As we went through this process, what we found, uh, we went through six different focus groups as the methodology, and they were in three different areas. So the first of which was Sydney, 
then we went to Melbourne, and then we went to Brisbane. So all of the people that we spoke with throughout this process were active considerers of New Zealand goods and services. So that meant that they were buying and purchasing goods and services quite regularly when it came to um, their everyday lives. We're also talking to businesses who were dealing with New Zealand exporters on a regular basis across a range of different sectors. So they were all business business interviews, but encompass tech, investment, tourism, food and beverage, a number of different areas, as you'll see as we go through each of the different sectors. Up there in the top right, you'll see that we actually did a piece of work in Australia in 2015, and I'll reference that as we go through this piece of work. And I've recently revisited it, and it is quite interesting to see what some of the changes have been from 2015 through to 2022. So I'll unpack that as we go through, but remember that all the research is in the toolkit uh, on the New Zealand Story website if you're interested in doing that deep dive yourself. All of this fieldwork was completed in May of 2022. So if you remember back to May, that's when Australia was going through their election process. And some of those insights might, uh, some of the insights that come through this might be evident as to how they were thinking and feeling at that time. To start off with, like we did with the video at the start of the presentation, we really like to understand what is the point of doing perceptions research in a market like Australia? Well, they're our second largest export market. Uh, we've got apparently the best trade agreement in the world, according to the World Trade Organization. We've got a really strong foundation in investing in each other. That sort of um, investment is a really core element of this trans-Tasman uh, economic relationship. And we have a real, really strong ease of doing business. So because of the single economic market agenda, we actually have a really seamless trans-Tasman business environment. And that's why it is actually really important to understand in depth how Australians perceive us. And it means that we can help New Zealand exporters make the most of the opportunity that this relationship presents for us. We like to start off any piece of perceptions research with just understanding why perceptions are important in the first place. So when you think about perceptions, they're part of our soft power as a nation on the world stage. And that's our ability to influence decisions made on the world stage without force, which is important for us as a smaller uh, nation in the world. Secondly, our perceptions help exporters start on the right foot in a new market. And key to success when you're starting out is really knowing that market context and realizing the different opportunities that that presents as you enter. Thirdly, perceptions help us see ourselves from a new perspective, and we can actually uncover strengths and vulnerabilities we may not have seen before, before we had this new and different perspective from outside New Zealand. When we are doing these pieces of perception research, so we've been doing them since 2015, our first market was Australia, we find that these four things always come through really strongly. So first of all, we always start by searching for commonalities and between us and Australia, that's that Anzac spirit, that sense that we've got a similar down under geographical location. Secondly, is that we look up rather than down, which means that for a while we may not be, have been um, considered by Australia as much as we may have been considering them given their position in the world. Third is that we all want to be famous for something and for Australians it does really centre around sport and that culture of winning and that sense of passion. As you'll see um, that may not be as strong as it used to be in 2015 but it's still coming through. Sometimes we just don't want to ignite that competitive spirit so we want to think about how are we different rather than better than uh, the Australian market. And then fourthly we always put ourselves at the centre of the world. So for Australia they see themselves as a really international and multicultural market and we need to turn up to pitch ourselves against the world rather than just uh, us and Australia. As David said as we're going through I'll split this into three sections and then we're going to stop for Q&A um, as we go through. So the first section is how consumers in Australia are thinking about themselves and how they're thinking about New Zealand. Secondly it'll be how do businesses in Australia think about New Zealand exporters and industries and then thirdly, it'll be the specific sector insights that we heard from both consumers and businesses as we go through. So remember, if you think of any questions, throw them into the comments and we'll get to them at each section as we go through. First of all, we like to look at how Australians see themselves um, because that helps us then see how they perceive us. So in 2015, we asked Australians to describe the country in one word. And in 2022, we actually saw a change in the narrative of how they saw themselves. So if you're trying to understand this slide, anything that's green means that it was more relevant. Anything that's yellow means it was a new association. Anything that's black didn't change. And anything that is red uh, is less relevant. So you'll see they're seeing themselves as more diverse and more friendly than ever. And this growing sense of opportunity and this increased sense of being a little bit more laid back than they may used to have been. 
But alongside that, they're seeing this growing sense of tension and this uh, reducing sense of egalitarianism, the sense that they may not um, have the ability to, to work as hard and get ahead that they once used to. Interestingly, and we go through this quite a bit, is that reducing relevance of that competitive spirit and also that reducing um, sense of being intolerant to others. So there's some real changes happening uh, when it comes to the way in which Australians are perceiving themselves um, and how that affects how they're starting to see others. So when we're thinking about how Australians think and feel about their own country, they're seeing themselves as really proud of their success as a nation, as well as their ability to stick by their mates along the way. So when they're thinking about themselves, they're seeing words like hardworking pop up, the sense that they were born from an egalitarian ethos, that the harder you work, that the better you do, and that there really are all of these opportunities for anyone who can follow their passion and that it'll always be a job for them. When they are thinking about themselves, like I said, they're seeing themselves as much more diverse um, than they used to in the past. The sense that anyone from around the world can find a home in Australia and be embraced, especially in those main centres. When they're feeling about themselves, it's really about resilience, that ability to even in adversity have a little bit of a laugh and to help things not fall apart. They're seeing themselves as really lucky, so not just their natural resources, but also their place in the world, making them um, relatively free from pot of poverty, war and feeling comfortable and safe. And thirdly, this feeling about themselves that they're really friendly, easy to get along with um, and easygoing, giving everyone a fair go that deserves it. So when we're thinking about entering into the Australian market, we need to start by recognising this pride they have for their country and remember to use their friendliness as this platform to start building that relationship as we go forward. We also look for the shadow that they see within themselves. And what came through really strongly in this round was this the sense that the promise of Australia is an open and welcoming place for everybody was starting to come into question. So that's where they're seeing themselves as more divided, which starts with political division, but also this growing sense of individualism within um, Australian communities. They're seeing uh, themselves in a, a wider sense as complacent. So the sense that this she'll be right culture means that they may have missed opportunities um, and thirdly, a sense that they were conservative, um, a sense that they may not have moved as quickly as others on social challenges particularly, and this growing socio-political divide has come about because of this. So they're feeling quite parochial, holding tight to what they have and this resentment around sharing it with others or maybe moving forward as fast as they could. This feeling that one of their shadows is the sense of garishness, that there's a little bit of cultural cringe that comes along with walking through an international airport, hearing somebody um, having a good time at a bar or something similar and feeling a bit cringy, the sense that they can be seen as larrikins in other countries. Um, and this growing sense of pressure. So they're seeing a number struggling to get ahead regardless of how hard they're working. And the ability for someone to come from nothing and succeed is getting much more difficult than it was in the past. So we need to be thinking about how can we highlight the success that we've found in moving past similar challenges and then how might it look for them. So if they're thinking about us as a more progressive nation, which they do, which I'll go through in a minute, how can we show that we've moved past some of these challenges to get to a better place? So the biggest change that we saw since 2015 was really the softening of the Australian psyche, where they're thinking more about what's best for life rather than just best for the economy. So they're less competitive and it's less of a focus of winning at all costs. And they're thinking more about their lifestyles um, as a whole and thinking about balance as opposed to just thinking about money. They're seeing themselves as less intolerant. So despite having a murky history, the sense of hope and realization that things are changing towards the better. And they're also seeing each other as less harsh. So lockdown did contribute to a sort of fresh sense of community, but also the sense of people slowing down and being a little bit more grateful for where they are meant they may be less harsh. So the important part of this is these defining values help them move closer to us as a country or closer to the values that they see New Zealand embodying. So there's never been a more interesting time. Uh, there's never been a better time to tell a story about uh, New Zealand and what we mean and what we're doing across the ditch in that Australian market. We've seen the shift towards inclusiveness rather than winning at all costs uh, has created a greater openness towards working together um, and working towards a better outcome for all because we've seen two big shifts in perspective. The first of which is a shift in who they look up to. So the United States in 2015 was this place that they really looked up to as something that was uh, um, they, were, they were looking up to it as a market that they wanted to emulate, whether that be politically or socially. 
um, and this has started to fall away a bit. So the curtain's being pulled back in a sense by the sort of Trumpian era, but they're also seeing growing social division that they don't want to replicate. And there's also a shift in what's aspirational. So they're more likely, uh, and the consumers were more likely to look up to countries like New Zealand and Scandinavian countries who were looking to focus more on the balance of their um, the balance of their citizens as opposed to just what was happening economically in the sense that they were trying to address growing inequality in a way in which they saw Australia as not. So that sense that who they look towards is changing which means that they actually see themselves in a different position that they once were when it came to their place in the world. They're seeing themselves as closer to us in the sense that we've got that common history, but also as they start to um, distrust others in that global market, that we become um, stronger, closer to them. We have that stronger bond. Secondly, when it came to Europe, so first of all, it was those smaller Scandinavian countries benchmarking themselves around sort of putting people first, but also those larger growing economies, uh, those larger economies in Europe, the likes of Germany and France, um, trying to think about how, what they're doing to get ahead, especially when it came to sustainability and tackling uh, climate change. Thirdly, was around the United Kingdom, just the sense that they were a consistent partner through Australia's history. And as they were moving further from the likes of the United States and China, how can they look to their economic strength and um, really re-establish that sense as a known partner? As I've been saying, they are moving further away from the United States because too often they're seeing the worst of American culture and sort of fearing for themselves. That sense they don't want to emulate what they're seeing from the United States. And compared to 2015 to now, there's a growing gap when it comes to the relationship between them and China from a consumer point of view, driven by this perceived lack of freedom, which is a value that Australians really hold dear. What's interesting about this is they're now looking towards a less well-worn path, where in the past they might have just looked to the United States to try and emulate what they were doing. They're often, they're now looking for leadership and confidence as they move forward to cut their own path and what that might look like and what might be best for Australia and Australians. So the implication here is that we need to start to talk to New Zealand's closeness as a country to start to accelerate that relationship and trust building. So now that we're seen as a place in which they can look to for um, support and for trust, how can we use that to really start to build those relationships and make the most out of what we're doing? So now we get to the interesting and important part, the fact that um, they perceive New Zealand differently to how they did in 2015. So in a similar way, we've um, come up with some of these key words when it comes to what they think of New Zealand. And as I was saying, since 2015, we have seen a shift. So the more relevant features coming through are Māori culture, the fact that we're forward thinking, our strong leadership, the sense of pride that they may not have seen before, uh, but also the sense of isolation that's coming through as well. There was a new, some new associations around being strict, scared and difficult. A lot of that was born through the closing of the Trans-Tasman bubble, but we'll talk about that as we go through. And the sense that we're now less casual, less close and less open than we may have been in the past. So when Australians are thinking and feeling about us, they're seeing a culture and people who are actually really embracing of others and focused on a balanced lifestyle. So when they're thinking about us, they're thinking about our leadership, this positively functioning political system. So not just our prime minister per se, but also our political system working as a whole country as opposed to different states, sometimes working against each other. They're seeing us as a nation of forward thinkers. We're progressive and inspiring in our thinking and policy. So LGBTQ plus came up as a specific example of that, but also when it came to climate change um, and other more progressive policy decisions that we've made. And thirdly, that as a people, we're quite practical. So we've got this get on with it approach. Um, because we're small, we need to roll up our sleeves just that little bit more and we work hard like they do. When they're feeling about us, there's really that sense that we're good natured, that we connect with others and we really value relationships that we build with people, that we're balanced whilst um, we are still working hard. We're also focused on our lifestyle rooted and being outside in nature and making the most of our lives. And also the sense that we're laid back. The positive sides of this remain that we are a little bit quaint and that can mean that we can be laid back, but it's almost something that they're aspiring to now rather than necessarily moving away from. 
So a big insight here, they're increasingly seeing us as a place that they can learn from and they can see the gains of a progressive mindset. So in 2015, we were, um, we were talking about the relationship between Australia and New Zealand, almost as New Zealand being this little cousin. And it's almost like we're starting to grow up that little bit more. And they're starting to see us as not necessarily um, on an equal footing, but seeing us doing things differently and seeing us uh, do things in a way in which is starting to make them rethink the way in which they're um, approaching how they do things also. So the implication there is that we can't be shy in leveraging the newfound aspiration New Zealand holds. And this is a really Australian way of saying we need to brag a little bit more. We need to talk about ourselves a little bit more. We almost need to take an Australian um, approach when it comes to talking about our success and the things that we're doing really, really well. Because when it comes to our shadows, when they're paying closer attention to us, they can also see the challenges that we face as a nation. And so when they're thinking about us, they're thinking small, expensive and behind. So some of these challenges, unfortunately, are coming from real world examples. So we talked to a few people who were working in trans-Tasman businesses who were directly seeing that those who are in the Australian market were getting more um, and not having as high uh, cost of living as opposed to their staff members in New Zealand. So there are some realities that come with this. But the sense that they see us as behind or not as advanced um, solidifies the sense that we're boring and reserved. So when they're feeling about us, they're seeing compared to themselves a little bit boring in terms of our limited city life and the sort of sense of excitement that comes with it. You can see they've still got quite an old view of uh, New Zealand social, um, New Zealand society when it comes to the sort of, sort of sense of masculine energy that can carry a darker side because they're still using lots of warriors as um, a line in the sand as to what that might look like and the sense that we're still reserved and we've got this culture of holding ourselves back. The positive news through this is if we take on that challenge of talking about New Zealand more and talking about our success, a lot of these shadows start to actually move away or start to dissipate, especially when it comes to boring, uh, behind and reserved. We can start to really uh, take a front foot in terms of showing off our achievements and directly challenging nearly every one of these shadows as we go forward. So the biggest change that they've seen since 2015 was this growing admiration of the way that we do things differently. So we're more admired and we're more caring. The sense that through the pandemic, they saw a version of New Zealand that they really looked up to, whether it was through the actions of our people or the actions of our prime minister. Uh, there's also the sense of integration of Maori culture, seeing that we have this relationship of respect where the two cultures work together that they look up to and admire. However, with the closing of the Trans-Tasman bubble, they're, they're actually seeing us as less welcoming. So the sense that they may have taken us for granted before, but when we closed off the Trans-Tasman bubble and said, no, actually, you can't come over to New Zealand, there was a sense that something had been taken away from them and that we may not have been taking the relationship as seriously. So because we're seen as less open and connected than we were before, we need to show that we do want to take this relationship seriously and that we're looking to make the effort to reconnect, that we're not going over to Australia and expecting things to happen, that we're actually there to make the effort and to continue forward with uh, what is one of our strongest trading partners. So if you think about the differences and the similarities between us, we do really share a lot when it comes to our values and our cultures, but we are seen as developing this clearer sense of identity to Australia than we may have had in the past. So if you think about some things like good natured, resourceful, proud, outdoorsy, generous, hardworking, humorous, there's a lot of the similarities that we can use to start to deepen our bonds that we share with each other. We need to make sure that we're leveraging to them to strengthen this connection and enabling us to work more closely together. So alongside that, we need to also remember what's unique to New Zealand and where we can actually offer something different to what Australia is offering itself. So where can we talk to our pragmatism, our forward thinkingness, our leadership, our sense of balance to help them realise what could be the best for Australia moving forward? So that is what we've got from a consumer perspective. It'd be great to open up the floor to some questions, David, if you've got some there. Yeah, Thank you very much. And I'm going to um, invite uh, Gabriel to join us too. That, that was wonderful walk through. Um, just picking up on a couple of comments that are coming through online. Uh, you can download this research report from the New Zealand Story website. Um, someone was having a bit of challenge with that earlier, but the team have been checking and it should be fine. It's quite a big report, so it will take a bit to download. Um, so Mary, if you 
if you get stuck, uh, send us an email, but um, hopefully you can do it. The other thing I just wanted to point out is that this this was multiple focus groups, wasn't it? It wasn't just six people, it was yeah. six groups. Oh, fact, six groups. groups. Yeah. yeah, of quite disparate people. Um, so quite a, uh, uh, an, a big survey and it complements, it sits on top of kind of a quantitative um, piece of work that we do with Cantar. So we, we, we do these pulse checks um, three or four times a year. We'll do a global pulse check in about 10 countries around the world. We have thousands of people who give us kind of data, but that data just get, doesn't tell you as much. It just says, you know, 38% of people thought this. Whereas when you get into this qualitative analysis, what Alex has done, you use that to inform the question. So the kind of the, the research methodology is pretty, is pretty sound. Um, so thank you, Alex, for that. And I just invite everyone to ask questions if they would like to. Um, one thing actually that came up, a, more of a comment than a question, which I really liked is, um, is this one here, Jerry saying that, you know, that feeling of national pride and of maybe thinking differently about the culture is really coming through. And it's quite obvious, I think. And those of us who visit Australia every now and then have definitely seen a switch. Gabriel sort of demonstrated it earlier, didn't he, Gabriel, in terms of understanding the role of Kind of the indigenous people and the culture and there's another example there do you want to comment yeah and that? yeah no that's that's a great comment and certainly people that haven't been to market for a couple of years sort of pre-covid are, are really commenting how things have changed and really kind of crystallized in the last year actually i know this research was done sort of around the time of the election but anthony albanese his first press conference um as the new prime minister he added the aboriginal flag and the torres strait islander flag um alongside the australian flag so fantastic symbolism of of a change moving forward there hmm. yeah and I guess that is the point behind this research, isn't it, Alex, is that things have changed and are changing quite rapidly. Mm -hmm. And if you go into Australia with a view that you might have had from 10 years ago or, you know, 15 years ago, you, you're probably missing on some pretty big shifts in, in their own psyche about themselves. Absolutely. Some of these insights come up a little bit later, but especially when it comes to the use of Te Reo Māori. Uh, in the past, we've heard travel agents saying, don't even bother putting Te Reo Māori onto things because Australians just don't want to hear it. And there's been this really sharp shift away from that. And they're really embracing um, hearing and understanding more about Te Reo Māori and Te Reo Māori as a whole. So I think there's some real opportunities that we need to think about. It's um, quite easy to not be complacent, but to think that Australia and New Zealand, our relationship doesn't really change too much. But even in the seven years between 2015 and 2022, there have been some really sharp shifts. So I think that's important to, to stay relevant, to keep on the ball. Yeah. Um, one of the comments that you made, and by the way, you know, people watching, please put, put your questions and comments in the chat, uh, either on LinkedIn or YouTube or on the website. But one of the comments you made, Alex, which I thought was interesting, is about the political systems. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean the kind of the, the national politics. It means the structure of the political systems. And I know that Australia has quite a bit more, you know, complexity, I suppose, in their political decision making. Gabriel, do you see that? You know, as part of New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, do you see that play out with exporters? They need to kind of really get their head around how that works. Yeah, I think that's a big um, challenge uh, exporters face is treating Australia as one market, but actually each state is quite nuanced. So, you know, you're not going to approach um, entry to market as Australia as a whole, but think about where your consumer is and does it make sense to come to Sydney or does it make sense to come to, to Melbourne um, to start with, you know, so really understanding the nuances of the states and certainly COVID has shown us um, the state premiers do have some power in terms of um, controlling borders and, and health settings and things. So there's definitely been um, a starker contrast between what happens at the state level versus the federal level um, that we hadn't seen sort of pre-pandemic. So, yeah. Um, it's a good question coming through from Kate, who'd like to know, do, you, do we get a feeling for how strongly Australians are kind of parochial in their purchasing decisions? Do they want to buy Australian made? Or, or does this newfound, I suppose, respect and um, consideration for New Zealand, you know, extend to the way they think about their purchasing as well? Alex, did you hear anything about that in the research? Yeah, when we talk to consumers, we're always seen as the next best thing to local. So it's hard to go up against Australian made because there is that sense of pride in uh, purchasing local, especially through COVID as well. That's become more important. But there's also the sense that if New Zealand succeeds and Australia succeeds as well, if we're three hours away from Sydney, it's almost like we're a state in some ways. So it's not necessarily uh, that they're choosing one versus the other. 
Um, and we found this in 2015 as well, that we need to be talking to how we're different, not necessarily how we're better. So if you're thinking about New Zealand made, it's not necessarily going straight up against Australian made, um, but it's slightly different in the way it's made. So if you think about New Zealand beef versus Australian beef, one might be more grain finished, one might, might be more grass fed, and there are differences to that and different reasons why one might yeah. be better than the other for certain situations. So it's more about complementing what they're already doing as opposed to going up and trying to attack that competitive spirit in, in some yeah. ways. What about you, Gabriel? Do you see this question here as something that you have to tackle or help New Zealand businesses tackle when they go there? Yeah, I think it, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, definitely local and um, trust in, in our sort of um, framework and, and food manufacturing processes. So that obviously plays to <clears throat> in, an advantage. Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, it, it's a hard one. I mean, obviously you need to be true to who, who you are and, and who your brand is. Um, yeah, and understand your consumer and what your end consumer is looking for. Mm. That's right. Um, good, good point here. A question from Steve: Does this does this mean we're kind of heading in the right direction from a relationship point of view? I mean, when you first showed us this research a couple of weeks ago, Alex, I, I made the comment that I thought this was incredibly positive. You know, particularly this consumer view. Later on, you know, not preceding what we're going to talk about, but there's a couple of watch outs for us. But this re this research is largely very positive for New Zealand, isn't it? So that, that things are tracking in the right direction, perhaps. Yeah, especially from a consumer point of view, there seems to be this real strengthening in the connection that we've got as two countries. Uh, the only speed bump was really in that trans-Tasman bubble being um, locked off so quickly. Um, and that wasn't necessarily that they couldn't come over here. It was the message that it then sent. So we need to make sure that we're still taking that relationship seriously and that we're presenting that we're not taking it for granted. But it is getting stronger, especially since last time we were in market. Yeah. Here's a good good question for you, Gabriel. Um, how important do you think it is communicating the kind of you know natural beauty of New Zealand, the wildness and outdoors? Is that something unique and inspiring? Does it sort of have an impact for exporters, for example? Yeah, that's that's a great question that we often get asked. You know, when you say natural in the New Zealand sense, it's often um, lakes and mountains and greenery. When you say natural in the Australian sense, it's it has images of beaches and waves and and oceans and and you know red desert. So I think it's just understanding um, you know what the sentiment of your specific audience who you're selling to in Australia um, and do they value those things and also be aware of the nuances and the words and the imagery that you put against that that language. Yeah. 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 One of the things I, um, sorry, Alex, one of the things I, I, I really noted in your report was this, this need to, to not be competitive or combative, but more to look at the commonalities and you, you know, and you bring it from the point of view that Australians have this pride in their country and this openness and friendliness, and we shouldn't go out there and try and sort of basically say we're bigger, we're better, we're faster, whatever, we should actually talk about what's common or, or how we can work together. Um, and I thought that was interesting because, you know, Ryan's made the same point here that we can be proud and loud without crossing the kind of humility line. Because that's the, that's the thing for New Zealand. We're naturally, we think we're naturally humble and it's, it's mm -hmm. tough to get the message right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think it's straight from the Australian psyche that they just think that means we need to brag more. Um, but it is trying to think about how we can do that and be true to our values at the same time, I think yeah. is, is really important. Um, to pick up on your point before, David, it's about being comparative. So. Um, yeah. we're, when we were in market for um, another project recently, it's not necessarily like when you're traveling, you want to see difference and you want to really experience difference. So nature in Australia is about brown, but maybe in New Zealand it is about green, you know, maybe about big, long, flat, expansive areas, but we're more about sort of mountainous, small valleys and creeks and things like that. So it's just about showing the comparative differences, not right. necessarily strengths or weaknesses. Yeah, exactly. Don't try and say this is better than that. It's more like, well, this is what we have and that's what you have and respecting yeah. both. Um, Michael's got a, a kind of a bit interesting, maybe controversial question here, and maybe it comes back to those bubbles that you showed us about how we think about ourselves. I mean, my perception is that most New Zealanders think of our, ourselves as a very innovative country, actually. Um, but I just wanted to check with you: is that is that do we get that feeling from the from the research that New Zealand and Australia are both thinking themselves as innovative? Yeah, there was the sense of needing to work through problems differently because of our place in the world, and that came through really strongly from both. Uh, when it comes to innovation particularly, we've got some uh, feedback from the market when it comes to how we do things and what we do, but the sense that we have to try hard to get to where we are and we do think differently. I think uh, when it comes to innovation particularly and pushing that story and being proud about that story, it might be a little bit different. So yes, we're seen as innovative, but are we seen as really promoting our innovation and our yeah. strengths in that area? Possibly not. 
And I wonder if that's a good point for us to get back into the research data, particularly around exports. Um, in fact, let's, let's throw to this question. To, to get us there, Janti is asking about, do you think the Australian international relationship can be complemented by our exports? And I guess that's kind of the next topic of conversation. So maybe Alex, we might throw to you and get into the sort of the business to business view. Yeah, absolutely. So as David alluded to, whilst we had a really positive response uh, in a consumer sense, we may not necessarily have had such a positive response from a B2B perspective or from a business perspective. So when it came to doing business with New Zealand, remember this came off uh, some interviews with importers of New Zealand goods and services. The first thing that we heard time and time again is that New Zealand businesses can be too focused on that first container. The sense that we send one order and then wait for the phone to ring and that we consider ourselves exporters when we've actually sent off one order rather than thinking about that relationship as a whole. So some of the things that we kept hearing time and time again is that Australian importers and businesses do really want that relationship. It's not just about um, sending over some New Zealand things to be sold on their shelves, but how can we actually start to build that relationship and how can we show that we're taking Australia seriously? So in 2015, some of this bubbled to the top once again, that sense that because we're so close to Australia, sometimes we can be seen as not necessarily taking it seriously and just dipping a toe in when it comes to how we export. Um, so they're really wanting us to go full force into Australia and show why we're committed and to show why we see Australia as important. And that comes through in the second point as well, that we fail to show up when it matters most and that we don't necessarily see how imperative it is to show up and support what we sell. So we often hear that in Australia, for something to really take off um, on the shelves, it needs a lot of support. And when you're thinking about Australia, they see that from the likes of what they're importing from Europe or from China or from the broader Asia region. But when they're seeing uh, New Zealand uh, products and services sort of sitting on the shelf, for want of a better term, we're, we're not seen as necessarily supporting them in the same way or supporting their efforts to um, sell or create those throughput rates. Thirdly, and it's sort of this ever growing um, chat list of challenges, but we're seen as hard to do business with. Because we're small and fragmented, it is quite hard to work with us at scale. So if you're thinking about supplying all of coals, it's quite hard to think about New Zealand as a place in which we can do that from across a number of different industries. So it really suits our craft image. So from a consumer perspective, that's positive, but it doesn't necessarily suit when we're trying to supply large Australian businesses that are looking to supply across the country. Fourthly, one of the positives that does come through is that we are hungry for success. So compared to Australia, New Zealanders were more likely to give things a go and to give things a go with less resources because that is the environment that we're in um, and that they do want to put a bet on us to sort of, um, to, and they want to back us when it comes to the things that we create, but they also want to see ourselves back ourselves in their own market and to take it seriously. We're not just shipping something off to our neighbour, we're taking the relationship really seriously and it's something that we need to do to succeed. We're also seen as quite expensive compared to others, and this has increased since 2015 as well. So we are the closest, but one of the most expensive countries to do business with. Shipping anything across the Tasman um, costs a lot, and it's one of the more expensive pieces of water in the entire world to ship things across. And we need to be aware that um, exporters, no, we need to be aware that um, margins and logistics are going to be different in the Australian market. So if we've sold something to Countdown and we're getting a 35% margin, that that's not necessarily going to be the same with Woolworths in Australia. One of the bonuses or one of the good things that keeps bubbling through is that our likeness is an advantage. So we can't underestimate the sort of peace of mind that comes with these shared regulations, systems and processes, which does bring a level of trust and ease of doing business because we are a really trusted uh, group of people when it comes to doing business, the sense that if you've got a handshake agreement with a Kiwi, they're going to come through on it. Um, and we need to make sure that we're using that to continue to build those relationships and not necessarily just send things over um, and expect them to work well just because they've got New Zealand on the packet. The thing that we hear time and time again, which encompasses nearly all of these B2B insights, is that we only get one bite of the cherry. So if you're thinking about Australian importers, they want to build this relationship they want to build something long-term just as much as they want a product to put on their shelves. And this first experience does really dictate how they'll use you again in the future and what success might look like as we're going forward. The implication of all of this is that we need to be ready to work 
to a different scale when we're going after the Australian opportunity and we can't be afraid to ask for more. So when we were talking to some of the um, B2B experts more in the investment space, they were saying that they'd time and time again talked to New Zealand businesses who were often even asking for too little when it came to expanding into the Australian market, um, turning up and asking for a million dollars instead of $10 million to do something properly and to really put ourselves out there to back ourselves to make a difference, to get out um, and take on Australia with full force like we need to rather than just toe dipping in as we have in the past. Um, as we go through, this is a um, collection of both the business and the consumer insights. We'll answer some of your business questions in a minute, but it's just worthwhile pausing on the values that we presented in, um, in a sense. These four values um, are what New Zealand Story are looking to um, roll out and underpin. You may have seen some of these before. I know David talks about them a lot, but we also tested them in these perceptions, uh, in these perceptions groups and interviews. So these values particularly bring to life this really aspirational version of New Zealand for Australians, and they do position us as world leading in progressiveness in our care for people. So first of all, kaitiakitanga, the sense of looking after people in place, uh, was really strong and fits with us really well. So. In a world full of environmental challenges, we're seen as somebody that can stand out in this place. But because Australia is so close to us, they do see the best and the worst. So we need to always be talking about facts and evidence to prove why we are different to the rest of the world and to prove how we are really living up to that 100% pure stamp. Secondly is Pono or integrity, the sense that we do what we say we will. And in some instances, uh, this value to Australians can feel a little bit more like a used car salesman, the sense we have to talk about our integrity. But because it is so true, because we are so transparent and we do um, work our relationships with integrity, it was seen as something that really suited New Zealand and that we could talk about a little bit more. When it came to Portikitanga, that um, sense or that um, spirit of the youngest child was seen as something that really grabbed attention and did align with this curiosity they associate with us as a country. It does lend us lend ourselves to that adventurous spirit that the younger child might have, but we need to make sure that it's not um, taking away or this adventurousness isn't taking away from the creativity or the ingeniousness that comes with the sense um, of having the spirit of the youngest child. And then lastly was manakitanga, the sense of welcoming. So they no one expect this from New Zealanders, especially the Maori that they had um, and they had um, they'd known. Um, but the sense that we don't judge and that we welcome newcomers as we go through. As I mentioned in the last Q and A, there is this really wide acceptance of these values and an special um, embracing of Te Reo Maori, and it is powerful and should be used in Australia. It shows them that New Zealand and Maori culture is inseparable and does communicate that we embrace our indigenous culture as well. So that's something they're aspiring to do and something that they really value when it comes to what we're doing and how that looks. The implication there is that we need to be embracing Maori culture and use New Zealand's values in your story to stand out in a truly meaningful way. Uh, that is the next stop point for Q&A, if there's any other questions or comments. Yeah, fabulous. Um, and please, yes, to those of you watching, um, now's a good time to plug in some more questions for Alex or Gabriel um, about, you know, particularly that export, export of you. Um, you know, when we when we look through that, there's a, it's a little bit more pause for thought here because the initial consumer view of New Zealand was is seems to be very positive, seems to be, you know, admiring New Zealand in many ways, but more cautious here, maybe Alex, in terms of how exporters are seen and how we show up. And just to reinforce a couple of points there, you're sort of saying that we've got to be careful that we look at a long term relationship, that we don't just sort of, you know, dump one uh, uh, set of products and then forget to kind of follow up. Um, you know, Gabriel, is that something that, you know, you see and, and uh, maybe a pattern of behaviour that we're trying to uh, train, uh, encourage people not to do? Yeah, I think, some, you know, as NZ to you, um, on the ground in Australia, we're really keen to work with exporters on their long-term growth strategy for the market. So first container is really just the starting point. If your, you know, five, 10-year strategy is to get your product in every Woolies in, in Australia, you need to be phoning up, you know, after that first container landed, how did it go? Do, when can we send the next one? Um, really be proactive in the way that you work with um, your distributors and, and the buyers in the market here. So certainly having a strong market entry strategy and a growth plan, um, digital commerce to enable that is all the things that we help with at, at NZTE. Mm. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, absolutely, and I, and you know that's not uncommon across most markets. Actually, the the danger that you know having worked at NZT for ten odd years as well um, with you and others, the danger is that New Zealand looks at Australia as just another bigger version of New Zealand and not something quite different. And I mean, Alex, what we're hearing here is that we have to think of it as a different market, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. And we need to be taking it quite seriously. So the fact that it is just across the Tasman or a three hour flight doesn't mean that it's any less important than some of our relationships in China um, or some of our relationships in America per se, just because they're close doesn't mean they're any less important. Um, some of these views as well have um, a much longer um, longer run sheet as well. So if I look, when I look back to 2015, we were hearing a lot of the same things coming through. So these are quite long held views and they are going to be quite difficult to break as well. So it's almost like we need to put in that extra effort and go over the top um, to start to break down some of the things that they may have experienced in the past. Good, good couple of questions coming in. Uh, they're a bit longer. So let me just sort of paraphrase them for you. Um, does this, uh, translate into categories where we directly compete. So obviously, you know, we want to think about where, and maybe Jerry's in this area, um, snacking, health, you know, health products, food products, you know, we do have, um, we are competing with some Australian brands on the shelves. Um, does that, does that change the way we need to think about it? Do we dial up or down the New Zealand this as we do that? What do you think, uh, Gabriel? Is that something you encounter? Yeah, I think it's more around leaning into the differences. So leading on Alex's research around um, we're not better or worse, but just um, how we play up the differences. And and the other point I didn't mention earlier, um, Entity has a Made With Care campaign, so um, branding for New Zealand F&B in Australia. And a lot of that talks to um, the connection to the land and how we sort of um, grow our premium food and beverage. So as opposed to the fact that it's better or worse than um, what you might get in Australia. So Yeah. And it's, I mean, it is, it, the Made With Care campaign has is, is been very successful in terms of positioning New Zealand as a place where high quality, you know, good for people, good for the land kind of food comes from. So I think it's, um, you know, the, tuning into the kind of campaigns that others are running. And, I, you know, I would say this, I'm from the New Zealand story, but dialing up the New Zealandness uh, is at times very, very um, useful for you to create a bigger halo around because your brand, I suppose. Um, I'm going to, there's a little comment here from Neil, who's obviously just reinforcing a couple of things that at least exporters show commitment by in-market presence, they can be struggled to, to be taken seriously. You know, Gabriel, what's the current, current wisdom here? Obviously with COVID, it's been pretty difficult to visit markets. Is this still a factor we see for businesses? Yeah, I think, I mean, get on the plane and get over here. I think that nothing beats a face-to-face -face connection um, and seeing firsthand on the ground um, what's changed, you know, how your product looks in this on the shelf here. So certainly, um, you know, be here, be a market and, and taking those face-to-face -face meetings with distributors makes a world of difference. So, yeah. Alex, was this something you heard about in terms of building relationship, you know, by face-to-face by -face communication? Yeah, we um, definitely heard it based on the fact of how close we were. It seemed like something that was easy enough to do and that we need to be doing more of it. Um, but also there was this expectation that we had more presence in the market as well, not just when it came to face to face. So that if we're putting things on shelves, we need to be showing that we're supporting those different markets, whether that be um, in campaigns or below the line or just having more of a presence in that retail space as well, I think is yeah. really important. Nice. Uh, another good question here, probably for you again, Gabriel. Um, Bernice is saying, what kind of support are these businesses? So we're looking for, when, so when uh, Woolies or, or Coles buys uh, or ranges a, a New Zealand product, are they looking for something from, from that company or from the country brand to kind of help them on shelf? Yeah, certainly there's an expectation of a, um, you know, brand building campaign or marketing strategy that comes along with, with that listing. Um, and that's a lot of what we're doing to tier supporting companies to, to do that. Um, and, you know, I guess a deeper understanding of who who your audience is and how they think and act. So I think we'll talk, come to our how to show up tool in a minute. But, um, yeah, we're really keen to help exporters understand who their, not demographics, but who their actual audience is in Australia and how we can um, market to those specific people. Um, so definitely it's more than just getting range on the shelf, but it's the, the campaign that you bring around that as well. Um, one quick comment here. Um, this question about Māori culture is really interesting and you know there's a couple of kind of really interesting assets for us you know this is probably more of a more of a, an open question that we need to ponder but we've got to be careful I suppose as Pākehā New Zealanders that we represent you know appropriately that we don't culturally appropriate um, 
others uh, language or culture inappropriately and uh, this is something that you know it's kind of part of the evolution I believe of how New Zealand thinks about ourselves in terms of um, the, the relationship between um, the indigenous people and the, and the Pakeha cultures etc and how this comes together so I know for example at New Zealand Story Group we've established a, a, an advisory group a Māori advisory group um, we have about six six leaders on there who are who kind of help and guide us on you know because my firm belief is that New Zealand needs to talk more about our Māori culture we need to use our language more um, but we need to do it in a way as you, as Francis says here uh, um, that is appropriate so that group guides us but it's a journey I think we're all on you know, I don't think we've got it completely sorted um, there's also a real desire from Australia is to see authenticity as well so because they are close to us they do understand that authenticity can be a bit of a challenge um, so it is as visible in the Australian market as it is back over here as well which is interesting and, and someone's asking a question about Australian values and this is something that we're probably you know as Australia emerges and, and, and thinks more about its indigenous culture and as you said earlier Gabriel is starting to really embrace um, some of the challenges of the past and and you know the Australian values will come to the fore do you do you understand is that something that you think that we'll start to need to work out how to align with etc yeah definitely and and it is you know an evolution and and changing um like I mentioned and, and not just in, from the Aboriginal point of view but you know sustainability ESG is firmly on the agenda here um again our election this year was a landmark in in terms of the teal independence they're calling them so they were campaigning on climate change agenda so um you know there's there's a lot of um changes happening on the ground here um and that will reflect in the um, values of Australians yeah I know we're doing some work at the moment with the FIFA Women's World Cup um nothing to do with export but it's but it's a massive sporting event that'll happen in New Zealand and, and Australia in a year mm -hmm. and we're co-hosting with Australia and it's been really interesting to be part of the conversations there about how both um Aboriginal culture and Maori culture will be used or will be highlighted or spotlighted I suppose through the festival and in a very genuine and authentic way and FIFA is really driving for that authenticity it's actually mm -hmm. creating some really cool conversations between um ourselves and our colleagues in Australia um on and how best to bring this to life so it's interesting um a couple of quick other questions coming through um a bit more tactical maybe uh one for you probably um Alex how significant are trans and shipping costs did it come up and uh you know have you got a magic wand <laughs> I, I haven't got any actions to mitigate per se um, but in the conversations that I had especially with food and beverage uh, importers it's it's huge so I had uh, one person saying that they could land things from China quicker and cheaper than they could get them over the Tasman and that it's a really tightly controlled shipping location so I don't know if that's down to like, I don't know how to solve that problem um, but it, it was something that, that they were very aware of what about you, Gabriel? You've obviously yeah. I, I think it's lot. great that it's been been raised in this forum. So hopefully, um, there is change coming. Um, at NZTE, we have a supply chain service, so we can um look through all the inputs into your manufacturing um and support that. So we can do what we can to help you um as an exporter. Um, but in terms of policy changes, that's probably beyond me at the moment. Nice. I wish we could all have that magic wand. Yeah. All right, there's a good question here from uh, Marinka, which will lead us to the third section. So, you know, thank you for asking that, which is about a sector view of this. So in particular, you know, Marinka's asking about the tech sector, technology sector. But I guess, Alex, you know, as part of the research, and I'll throw to you now to, to look a little more from a sector by sector view, because I think you looked at a few yeah, different excellent. sectors. We sure did. Uh, New Zealand Tech does come up as well, so we'll be able to talk to that specifically. Um, and happy to take any questions as they come through for that as well. Right. So as Dave was saying, we looked at different sectors when we were talking to both uh, the business people that we were speaking with, as well as the consumers. So we looked at travel and tourism, skincare and beauty, education, manufacturing, food and beverage and technology. So uh, skincare and beauty was a one-off uh, dip that we did just in Australia based on um, some of the things that we sell over there. When we we're asking broadly what Australian consumers were thinking about when they think New Zealand made, it really centered around the sense of quality they could trust and it being the next best thing to local. Um, so as we were talking about, it's not necessarily about better, but it's about different. So there's a sense of authenticity and integrity that comes with the products that we make. So the sense that New Zealanders understand what's right and good, and we take pride in what we deliver. So the, the, the sense that we put effort into the things that we produce and that they don't question the quality when it comes from New Zealand itself. 
We talked about this in a little bit, but 100% Pure came through really strongly, the sense that we've got pure air, a quality of environment that's less polluted, and it looks more clean and pure, um, especially when you're thinking about some of the images that you might see from an Australian growing environment to a New Zealand growing environment. And that leads on to the sense that we're also natural. So what we do produce doesn't necessarily feel manufactured or have any unnecessary things. So it stays true to the natural goodness of the ingredients that we're putting in there. And what was a limiting factor when it came to how uh, the businesses were thinking and talking about us is actually a positive when it comes to how consumers are thinking about the things that we make and produce. So the sense that we've got really small batch, high quality and um, great workmanship that goes into the things that we make. So we might be limited in scale or a bit more expensive, but what we make is superior. And if you're thinking really quickly about all the things that we make and create, Australians actually have a really good understanding of the things that we're best at doing. So we're still world famous in Australia for Savvy Bees and for Whitaker's Chocolate. 100% Pure has this real great halo effect across all of our F&B and primary sectors, and that did extend into skincare as well. There was this understanding of our strong creative industry. So Lord of the Rings, Taika Waititi come up, but also the likes of Jono and Ben. So slightly more niche offerings are still popping up to the top. When it came to skincare, there was a sense that we were straight from nature and free of any harsh ingredients. So once again, through into that 100% pure, working really well in that space. We're seen as manufacturing really good quality products made for the environment that we're living in. So when they think about New Zealand, they are thinking about mountains and getting out and being outdoors. So the likes of MacPac and Mons Royale are working really well there. And there is this real understanding of our quirky and distinctive things that are unique to New Zealand. So LMP, Air New Zealand safety videos all start to bubble to the top when they're thinking about the things that we make and create. So it's when we actually start to weave together our culture and our environment, that that's when we're producing things that actually feel different, interesting and worthwhile compared to what they can get from anywhere else in the world. And so this is where we'll go through each sector specifically. And I won't go through all of the content on these slides because they're quite dense. But what I do suggest you do is if this is your industry, um, take one of these away and just read through it um, carefully. But what I'm going to do is just talk through how we got here and what some of the different things mean. So if we're thinking about food and beverage, there was this real shift from claiming pure and natural through to how we're showing pure and natural and starting to lead the world. So we asked consumers to think about different images that worked well in the food and beverage space. And you'll see there it's all about premium quality and experience, fresh, healthy, seasonal, showing the best um, of our ingredients in their natural habitat. The sort of link back to culture and tradition where possible, as well as growing sustainably in, the, in our pure environments so or that sense of being straight from the land. We asked each of our consumers what values we thought lined up with that the most. So the lead value here for food and beverages, kaitiakitanga, or that sense of looking after people in place. And when they're thinking about food and beverage in their own context, from a consumer point of view, they really could, would buy more if they could because they really love what we create. There's this assumption of great taste and freshness and that what we produce is as close to nature as possible. So what we need to be doing in that space is actually exaggerating some of these environmental and ethical practices and using imagery of where things are grown to give that contrast, which isn't necessarily that it's better, but it is different when it's come from a New Zealand landscape as opposed to an Australian. And we also need to think about how do we start to break down some of those challenges when it comes to the fact that availability isn't as good as it used to be and that they're paying more of a premium than they used to as well. When it came to the business perceptions, and this really strongly came through um, all of the other feedback we heard, but the sense that we are actually going up against some big spenders in the Australian market. So launching products in the past may not have gone so well if we haven't actually put the spend behind it. And importers are really wanting to see us be prepared to spend that significant amount, especially on sharp pricing as we enter the market. So we're meeting those minimum sell through rates. But we do have an ability and a reputation for doing things differently and for creating great products. So that still comes through really strongly. Um, one of the challenges that came through specifically for food and beverage was I was talking to one importer who said that he could get something shipped from New Zealand to Australia manufactured and then shipped back to New Zealand for less and at a better quality than he could making keeping it in New Zealand and keeping it um, manufactured in New Zealand at the same time he was uh, working in New Zealand and Australia at the same time so we need to make sure that we can actually um, manufacture to a standard um, in New Zealand as well then not need to ship things off to Australia even for ourselves 
when it came to education, we were seen as creating new world leaders. So we want to be really bringing to life that sense of curiosity driven innovation and how we're leading in R&D, our small classrooms, personalized teaching, that we do have these growing areas of excellence. And this has come through really strongly, not just in Australia, but other markets that we speak to. Whilst in the past, New Zealand might have been a place to go to have a bit of a, a fun semester in a new country. We're now seen as a place where you can really learn about the best of environmental and political sciences. That's come a little bit from our, our popularity of our leader, uh, but it also has come from some of the things that we're out there saying in the global market. We're also seen as really welcoming and inclusive, the sense that we do welcome everybody. And it's increasingly important in quite a div divided world, and it's really believable when it's coming from us as well. Just generally that we need to take on, um, that we need to show that we've got a differentiated take on learning, that we bring in some of that adventurousness and that approach to learning that can happen sort of beyond the classroom, that we lead in innovation and that we've got a real hands-on can-do approach that reflects our ingenious and innovative way that we think and do things. So how can we start to highlight our innovations that little bit more when we're talking about education in the Australian market? For travel and tourism, it's almost like the whole world is brand new again. So when they're thinking about uh, coming to New Zealand, uh, or when they're thinking about where to go on holiday, they've been stuck in Australia for the last two and a half years. And whilst they might have been to Bali 15 times because they go every Christmas to hang out with their family, they haven't been able to go to Bali for two, two and a half years. So Bali's actually feeling really new and exciting and different again. So we need to remember whilst we've opened up to them, other countries around them that they used to love and visit often have also opened up to them as well. So we need to really be presenting the best of New Zealand and what we can be um, offering them as a holiday destination. So we need to be thinking about exhilarating and thrilling. So adventure does remain a draw to the Australian market and they are just expecting to see some photos of those um, those thrill experiences, but we also need to show that we are going to welcome them. So the sense that the Trans-Tasman bubble um, closed off and they're still worried that we may not be as welcoming as we used to be when it comes to visitors. So how can we actually get them in touch with the local community? How can we make them feel like they're relaxing and refreshing and they're going to be part um, of a really amazing experience? As always, we need to be still talking about local cuisine, enjoying quality food, and starting to challenge some of those boring and small and not as developed uh, notions that we had from our shadows that I talked about earlier. There's actually a limited knowledge in Australia around everything there is to do in New Zealand, because as one business put it, New Zealand is a multi-point and experience-rich destination that requires a high level of expertise to actually piece together and sell particularly well. So when they're thinking about Bali, they can go into a travel agent, they've got a package there, they just need to swipe their card and off they go. They've got childcare, they've got things to do, they've got a place to stay. But when they're thinking about New Zealand, they actually need to have quite a knowledgeable helper who can sort of start to simplify and centralise some of the things that you can do in New Zealand because we are so rich in things. It's actually quite hard to piece together what that might look like. And if you think about some of our partners, like uh, Flight Centre in this uh, case, they've lost 25,000 staff members due to COVID, and we're going to have to start to build familiarity with these markets again to start them um, on, a, on a journey to creating a more simple experience or a more simple itinerary for these travellers. New Zealand does come with lower margins compared to likes of a uh, European holiday or even Bali. Uh, so we need to keep that in mind. But some of the interesting things coming through around regenerative tourism, the fact that we could actually start to position ourselves as one of the leaders in the world here, but they aren't necessarily seeing that from us just yet. So we need more guidelines to ensure that what we're, what they're trying to sell about us, we're actually doing. And increasingly, price is actually more of a barrier to consideration than it used to be in the past. And we need to keep that in mind to make sure that we're continuing to keep that funnel full post this boom of uh, visiting friends and relatives uh, coming in from Australia. When it came to skincare and beauty, there was this halo that sort of came through from the food and beverage space around homegrown and locally sourced, but also coming through that we're cosmopolitan at the same time. So we got that sense that we've got a differentiated sense of style. We're from our land and natural resources. We've also got that technology that goes into products too, and that there's a bit of a story behind who we are and why we're doing it. We stand for natural and high quality in this space. And whilst there's normally a hesitancy to try something new when it comes to skincare and beauty, our transparency and our goodness that comes from being natural and um, beautiful and high quality means that they're more likely to trust us. But environment is a growing concern. So we need to make sure that we're reaffirming that sense of sustainable effects and figures when we are selling what we are.
It's not just saying that we're clean and pure, it's the evidence that supports that at the same time. When it came to tech and investment, they were seen as a place where ingenuity was bred from our place in the world. But we need to really reaffirm that we've got the infrastructure and spaces for these things to happen. We need to talk about our innovative and forward thinking. We need to celebrate discoveries. We need to talk about it a little bit more. But also, how can we talk about our history and culture as one that was world leading and innovative and doing things differently, um, even in the past? So when you're thinking about consumers in this space, they do see us as honest and integral, which means they are more likely to feel trustworthy when it comes to the goods and investments that they are investing in. And we need to utilize any New Zealand origin stories and comms when it comes to investment, particularly to leverage that sense of honesty and trust. But it seems to um, consumers particularly that it's an area that we have made ground in, but to them, it seemed like there was a lack of investment or scale to develop some of that credibility. So we have been too humble in the past. and We should be actually bragging even at a consumer level around what we've done. From a business perspective, we need to start to link ingenuity to our place in the world. The fact that we are who we are and we're innovative because of our care for place and the future. And we need to really draw on that sustainability space as much as we can because it's something that people think about in the first instance when they think about New Zealand and how do we actually start to talk that up when it comes to what we do and create. We are seen, as I mentioned earlier in the pack, as a great place for startups and a great place to invest rather than necessarily a great place to find talent. And we need to use more than just our geography to put ourselves at the sort of centre of the map. How can we start to bring in entrepreneurs, not just because we're a nice place to live, but also because we're a great place to start a business. Being one country worked really well and not being divided into states as well. Um, but the sense that because there is this lack of funding in the New Zealand tech space that it makes us more determined and we almost have a greater clarity of purpose because if we don't succeed, then we've got nothing to fall back on essentially. So how can we show that we've got that better capital? Uh, how can we sort of create bigger budgets, show that we've got a better talent pool and start to build that depth of capital as we go through? Finally, when it came to manufacturing, this is always the hardest one for consumers to really consider because when they think of New Zealand, they think of this amazing Garden of Eden that's beautiful and green. So when we start to get into thinking about manufacturing, it can be a little bit tough. But what they were wanting to see was care for every step of the journey. The sense of what we create is really high quality, that it's done in a sustainable way. That's more about collaboration than necessarily us doing everything by ourselves and leaning on the best of technology to make sure that what we're making is the best in the world and we're not just pumping out um, commodity stuff. So essentially they've already got this really high perception of quality and trust in what we make and produce that'll be durable and that'll be made with attention. So we need to really talk about how that is the case and why our quality is better. We do have really clear design aesthetic, especially in that um, outdoor clothing space from Matpac and Mons Royale. Um, so it's essentially both contemporary and born from our unique environment. So there are some real unique aspects there. Um, and we need to remember that the environment in which we manufacture matters. So we need to talk about sustainability as well as care and craftsmanship as we go through. From a business perspective, they were really wanting to bring manufacturing back to Australia. And by um, proxy, it also meant bringing manufacturing back to New Zealand because we were three hours away. It might feel a little bit further than it used to, but at least it was sort of in the area and not as far as um, it maybe used to be. Uh, and lastly, there was this real opportunity in highly regulated sectors because we do have similar regulations and understanding of their own regulations in sectors like medical technologies that have really high quality and regulatory standards. There's an opportunity to us to talk to that similarity in the way in which we're doing business. And so that's what we heard for the sectors. But as a bit of a wrap up for the whole pack, We've got four takeaway comments here to win Australia. So number one, it's about talking to New Zealand's closeness as a country to start to accelerate relationships and build trust. Secondly, we can't be shy in leveraging the newfound aspiration New Zealand holds for Australians and what that means for us. We need to be ready to work to a different scale when going after that Australian opportunity. Don't be afraid to ask for more and don't be afraid to dive straight in. And then fourthly was embracing Maori culture and using New Zealand's values and your story to stand out in a truly meaningful way. And that's it. We'd love to take any other questions or comments or thoughts that you may have about what we found or what was interesting. Fabulous job, Alex. A lot to get through there. And you know, in that, as you said, in that sector view in particular, there's lots of nuance and detail. So we're probably going to get, not going to be able to get to every bit of it. Um, but some really um, you know, insightful things there. Um, one question um, that 
or comment that came up is that this progressive view of Australians that have that, that Australia has of New Zealand might prove to be good for some of our more progressive brands, you know. So if we are associated with things interesting, innovative, liberal, whatever, um, some of our you know new formats, for example, like plant based, etc., might come through. Gabriel, do you see a bit of interest in that? Do you think from the Australian consumers that you work with? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So so if your audience is looking for sort of innovative um, leading products, then then absolutely lean into that. Um, and in, in terms of dialing up the difference, so not a competitive way, but just the way that, you know, we're progressive and, and how we show up in markets. So yeah, a great example. Yeah. Um, Alex, did we do any research around services rather than just sort of product bases as well? I suppose the tech area leans into that a bit. But yeah, yeah, tech was the main one there, but not necessarily um, professional services or anything similar to that, no. Okay, and what about uh, sports? <laughs> not really a sector, but um, Ryan's suggestion here is that, you know, rugby is one thing that we see that we have in common. Uh, it's probably much more relevant for New Zealanders than it is for most Australians, but it's something where we have this competitive spirit. You know, did that come through as part of your conversations? Not as strongly as I thought it would. I think it's a different type of competitive in some way because it almost fuels their own competitive spirit and there's a bit of uh, Anzac sort of back and forth that is underpinning in our relationship, but it's yeah. less so going out and really saying that we're better. It's almost just talking up the fact that we're both great and that we're sort of yeah. the best of each other um, I'd probably, in that environment. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and certainly rugby union does not have a strong following in Australia. So um, yeah. if we're talking NRL um, or AFL, then maybe you know that could that could be good. But um, yeah, just be careful. Union can have kind of an elitist view. Right. I think, the definition yeah. of rugby changes as you cross the Tasman, doesn't it? Pretty much. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the rules change. Um, one more, um, or maybe a couple more quick questions. Someone's asking here: do, you, do we think in the research, either through this or through Cantar's research, do we get different views from different demographics, perhaps? Alex, maybe go to you first. You're the research professional here. Yes, absolutely. Um, what we find is that the younger generation do have a much more progressive view and they do look up to that progressive view that little bit more. Um, but it's not necessarily to say that the older generations aren't as well. So we talked to a real range of ages when it come, came to these groups. And you find that it's often some of the the older consumers that do have some of these realizations that maybe the way that Australia was doing things in the past aren't the best way to to do them now and it is a real mix across different ages and stages and people and beliefs so I wouldn't say it's definitely down to age uh, because some of the greatest uh, sort of revolutionary insights do come from the older generation and seeing the changes that have happened um, but yeah anything quantitatively David that that comes through um no, I think that's one one final question actually, because you made this good comment about um, seeing New Zealand as a talent pool. But what this um, person uses is saying here is maybe it goes the other way. You know, this is quite a long comment, but they're saying here that some sometimes Australia sees themselves as quite an aggressive macho sort of culture, and maybe New Zealand is perceived a bit differently. Maybe that's an opportunity for us to compete in a different way for talent. Uh, is that something? Uh, I mean, my, uh, Gabriel, you you live and work in Australia. Of course, the, your colleagues are not you know toxic, but um, is this something you see? Clearly this is written by from someone in uh, Melbourne too, by the way. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, um, no, it's interesting. I mean, there's pockets of it maybe like that, but certainly change, change is coming. Um, and one fantastic example in New South Wales, um, the most recent state budget um, had a um, woman's economic participation at the foundation of that. And that was, you know, universal childcare and things that, you know, we don't, haven't had in Australia in the past. So in time, you'll see a lot more... Um, Women coming through and and have and um, you know strong focus on sort of gender equality in that area. Um, certainly for businesses hiring in market in Australia, um, what's your employee value proposition? How do you differentiate from an Australian company? So certainly you could dial that up in terms of um, your recruitment strategy in market. That's a, that's a great point. So mm. yeah, I think we're we're nearly out of time. We've got just a couple of comments that I want to finish with, but um, I just I've just pulled out some nice things that are coming through. Good idea. Let's give the, the technology a bit of an up. I said at the beginning that we were a bit worried because it's the first time we've used it, but it's called StreamYard. If you want to use it, congratulations uh, to my team actually behind the scenes who are, who are doing all the magic. Uh, it, does, it does seem to work pretty well, so we, we're quite happy with it. Thank you. Um, and then uh, a lovely comment here from Julie, uh, Julia, uh, Julia Ann, who basically says it's you know a great, great presentation. I mean, Alex, thank you so much for the work that you put into really understanding this information and giving it giving it to everybody. Um, so, you know, really good to have both of you here. I wanted to finish um, actually with a, a, a quick conversation, um, Gabriel, about 
NZT and how you help exporters as well as um, some other things. And I know that you've now, you've recently got this new thing called the How to Show Up in Australia tool. Do you want to quickly talk about that? Yeah, certainly. So I guess, you know, coming from the previous assumption that Australia is just a bigger New Zealand, we really wanted to challenge that and help our exporters think about how Australia could be um, different from New Zealand and, and how to sort of um, build a brand in this market. So what the tool does is a quick little questionnaire to understand what type of audience resonates for your product. Um, and then it, and it's not just demographics, but it's, you know, what how do they think and feel and act and who would they engage with and when do they buy? Um, so you get an output that sort of explains all of that, um, helps you to think differently about New Zealand and provides some really strong kind of guidelines around building a brand in this market um, and sort of a, a marketing toolkit in a box, as I guess. Um, and from there, you could um, brief agencies on, you know, how to build how, your branding strategy for Australia. So it's a fantastic tool um, that you can reach out to your NZT contacts, so your customer manager or um, your specialist in market in Australia um, to help you work through that. So. That's right, some good practical tips. And another thing I wanted to talk about is the Fernmark license program. So the New Zealand Fernmark, I wear it here proudly, is the, um, the trademark for New Zealand. And we uh, licensed this out. The New Zealand Story um, is responsible for managing this trademark and we licensed it out We've got over you know, 460 um, companies currently using the, the license and um, they put it on their products. Uh, they often have it on their websites, et cetera. You can see their wide range of industries um, will use that trademark. And then we protect it really carefully, you know, as a, as a trademark. So 30, 30 odd jurisdictions adding more all the time. Um, it's a great way to attach your brand to the brand of New Zealand, you know, and in countries where they have a high uh, perception of New Zealand, like Australia, as we've just heard, uh, it's a great way to get your 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 kind of uh, country story out there. Um, and the international research that we've done and others have done shows us that it actually is the most recognised symbol of New Zealand, uh, more so than other things. Um, and so therefore, you know, it's a great way to get uh, New Zealand's brand out there. And I'm going to finish actually, um, as well as showing you some of the, the companies that use the New Zealand food mark, I wanted to finish with a little video that we did recently in Sydney uh, with a bit of fun. But we're going to finish with that. So before I throw to that video, I'll just want to say thank you to Alex. Um, thank you so much for the work that you do and uh, One Picture and the, the rest of your team. Um, Thanks, and, to, and to Gabriel as well. Thanks for joining us. I added a lot having the market view. You didn't quite have the, the you know, Sydney Harbour Bridge behind you, like, as we were hoping, you know, but it was. I have to upgrade my office, but. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'll have a chat with the TA, see if I can get you a, a Harbour Bridge view. But really, really appreciate both of you um, and appreciate everyone out there watching. Uh, it's been a great session uh, and thanks very much. So with that, I will throw to the video. Uh, Nami Hinui, um, have a great day. G'day, my name's Nick and today we are here in beautiful Sydney. We know that logos and symbols can be intrinsically connected to the companies that own them. But can the same be said of countries? Is there a logo or symbol that when you see it, you instantly think of that country? Let's go and find out what some Aussies have to say. I'm going to show you some symbols and you've got to tell me where they're from. So where's this? Uh, India. 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 Correct. This one. Australia? Australia. What an <laughs> awful response. <laughs> Incorrect. New Zealand. Where's that? That's uh, the Kiwi flag, mate. Correct. Everyone says Australia. And this one. Pluggers. Australia. In Hawaii, we call them slippers. Australia. Thongs. We take Australia. Ah, thongs. <sighs> Jandals. What's, what's a jandal? Right. Well, a thong goes up your backside, as far as I know, so... Where are you from? From New Zealand. All right, this isn't fair. Where's this? Oh, New Zealand, clearly, with the fern, yep. It's a silver fern, New Zealand. New Zealand. Exactly right. What country does this represent? New Zealand. New Zealand. Correct. Everyone knows it. All right, the results are in. We've heard everyone loud and clear. When people see this magnificent symbol, they instantly think of New Zealand, and that's a pretty good place to think of.